Building a future if you're new on the journey with us. Uh, you need to understand that today we're actually, we're actually enjoying the benefits of other people's sacrificial sowing. Come on, do you agree with me? Right now, all of us, across all our campuses, we've got church services. Uh, we're actually enjoying today what were people's sacrificial uh, sowing from years gone by. You know, when you turned up to church today, 5, 10, 15 minutes late, whatever, there was no, there was no building fairy that waved the wand and ta-da, the building was just there. We're sitting in someone else's sacrificial sowing of the past. So we can't drop the ball now because we need to keep sowing for the future. Amen. You know, and we understand that this is, this is God's uh, uh, way. It's, it's, it's not a momentary kingdom, but a generational one. And this is how God thinks. The gospel is always, it's always seeded in our DNA as Christians, not to be takers, but to be givers, to think about people beyond ourselves. So I want to encourage you, come on the journey uh, with us because over the next three weeks and what I love about these, these seasons of thinking generationally thinking about legacy you would have seen on the welcome wall that legacy is leaving something behind that outlives us is that we need to transition to a truer place of discipleship where we go from just having our faith our Christianity being about God what can you do for me today to saying God what can you do through me today how many of you want to be that kind of believer this morning and so we're going to transition ourselves through that. And as we're hearing the Word of God uh, over the next uh, couple of Sundays, my prayer for us is that we really catch the heart of God's heart for us. So 1 Chronicles chapter 17, I'm going to read from 1 Chronicles chapter 17. We drop in on a very important conversation there. Conversations in the Bible that, that are really key at different times throughout uh, biblical history. This is one such important conversation where the prophet Nathan, who had journeyed through the reign of King David at the time, King David was an Old Testament king whose life was really a foretelling picture of the Christ that was to come. And, and uh, back in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, God would choose specific prophets to speak the very words of God to kings or to different people groups. And so God is having this conversation with King David, not as a young shepherd boy, but towards the pointy end of his life. How I many of you know what the pointy end of a person's life is? David has lived far more years than he's got years left to live. And the conversations of your life change, I reckon, as you get older. How many of you would agree? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the things that you think about, the things that you consider as part of your life begin to change towards the pointy end of your life. And here God begins to have a conversation with David about legacy, about what he's going to be leaving behind. 1 Chronicles 17 verse 11, it says, And it shall be... David, when your days are fulfilled, in other words, when your life is through and through, when you must go to be with your fathers or your time here on earth must end, that I will set up your seed after you. How many of you realize that God is concerned about what comes after you? Yes, come, on. come on, I need a resounding amen. Yes, amen. Who will be of your sons and I will establish his kingdom. Thinking generationally, right? He shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his heavenly father. He shall be my son and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever according to all these words and according to all this vision. So Nathan spoke to David. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house or my family that you have brought me this far? When I read... Passages like this one in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, particularly around the time of thinking generationally, considering my own life, it does ask the question, what am I doing with my life? How many of you have asked that question? How many of you asked that question this morning? How many of you asked that question Monday morning? What am I doing with my life? I've got to go to work. It's, it's a relevant question. If I, if I were to go be with Jesus tomorrow, will I leave something behind that will make a difference to others? You know, there's the, the, these questions that whenever I come around this time of thinking about legacy and talking to God about it, there, there are these questions in my own heart, which I'm sure maybe uh, you're, you're the same. I, I, I ask myself, God, is there more to my life than just to be remembered for a few funny jokes, a few quirky habits, and my love for football and fishing? <laughs> is, is there more to me? And these are important legacy questions because at its core, being generational-minded, being legacy-minded is actually a kingdom attitude. In the book of Proverbs chapter 13, verse 19 says this, Walk with the wise and become wise, but associate with fools and get in trouble. Never true word said. Trouble chases or pursues sinners while blessings reward the righteous or the upstanding. And I love this. Good people, godly people, people that fear God, leave an inheritance 
to their grandchildren. God didn't create you and I to simply be memory leaving people. He created you and I to be legacy leaving people. Yeah. Come on, are you out there? Yeah. God didn't create us to simply just leave a few fond memories behind. We see it all through scripture. And, and when we, we do see something like this and we read this conversation that God is having with David at the pointy end of his life, it's easy for us to feel a little bit detached and go, well, that's good for David because he's a biblical character. He's a very key biblical character. What does that have to do with an ordinary guy, an ordinary lady just like me? And, and, you know, I'm struggling along. I'm struggling to pay the rent or pay the mortgage and put kids through school and, you, you know, hope, hope my footy team wins this weekend. <laughs> Third loss in a row. <laughs> Maybe trying to avert the dreaded winter flu and, and all that. I'm just, I'm just getting by. I'm just ordinary, you know. And when I often ask God, uh, you know, these sort of conversations, it, and I read this passage in 1 Chronicles chapter uh, 17 about this amazing, great conversation about legacy that God has with David, it occurred to me that David wasn't born a king. He was born very ordinary. So this morning I want to speak to you on private victory, public legacy. Private victory, public legacy. Like I said before, God has a conversation with David at the end of his life. He's clearly king. He has been on the throne. He's a person of great influence. God gives him a very public legacy. But it's so much, but what's interesting for me is the kind of conversation that God has with this man towards the end of his life. I began to be incredibly challenged by that. The Holy Spirit asked me, Ken, what kind of conversation do you think I'm going to have with you at the pointy end of your life? It's a great thing to consider. As we who have read a bit of the, the Bible story, the David story, you need to know that David was not born into a perfect scenario. Hello. He, we were first introduced to him in 1 Samuel chapter 16 as a shepherd boy. He was rejected by his father. We don't know who his mother is. There's no record of that. He is not liked by his brothers. He was mistreated by the king at the time, King Saul. He was hunted like an animal. He made some mistakes. He committed adultery, all of those sorts of things. But you got to understand that God does not, at the pointy end of David's life, have a conversation with David about... Oh, David, you know, uh, were you really offended by Saul when he mistreated you or didn't bring up Bathsheba, didn't bring up his father's rejection, didn't bring up any of those things that make us ordinary and human. God speaks to David about legacy. Your failings, your circumstances do not define your legacy. What you do in your life now sets up your legacy. Notice how God doesn't bring up all the things that might have been big deals to us. You would have thought that God at the end of David's life We'll talk to him about the big deals of his life, the rejection from his dad, and being, being mistreated by Saul. Well, it was so unfair, wasn't it, David? No, God begins to speak to David, not about what's happened to him, but what he's going to leave behind. It began to occur to me then that God maybe gave David a public legacy because throughout his life he was prepared to win some private victories. Come on, are you out there this morning? God grants us public legacy in the future when we're prepared to have some private victory today. We don't get to leave a great legacy that the next generation can see one day unless we're prepared to steward and sow into the things that no one can see today. Public legacy comes because of private victory. Somebody say amen. The life of David teaches us the power of these Private victories that sets us up for the conversation that God might have with us at the pointy end of our lives. There are four private victories I want to I want to pull out of scripture, exegete out of scripture for you this morning. Is that okay? Yeah. Like I talked about before, that the, the first thing I reckon that was so powerful about David's life is that we're not introduced to a guy that was born with a prince's robe on his shoulder. We're not introduced to David in the palace. We're not introduced to David with a crown on his head. We're introduced to a shepherd boy in a pasture. His own father doesn't think much about him, that even forgets that he's even out there when, when the prophet comes and asks him to parade all his sons for the future king potential to be auditioned. And, and he, he, David's life, if you were to look at the, the, the stuff surrounding what we can piece together in scripture, that his father does not acknowledge him. We don't know who his mother is. His brothers don't like him. All the mistreatments at, a, at, at a, just a, a face value level, when we look at how David's life started, we would have all probably thought on natural, just natural calculations, this guy is going to end up with some behavioral problems. He's going to be bitter and twisted. He's going to be a bit narky. He's going to be a bit cynical. Yeah. Nothing about his life pointed to, at the time, pointed to the fact that one day he's going to leave a king's legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Gives great hope 
for all of us normal people that we're journeying with stuff. But God still believes in what we're going to be leaving behind. Come on, are you out there? But the reason why I reckon God set up David for a public legacy is firstly because he was prepared to win private victories over his personal circumstances. Imagine if David never dealt with the baggage from his dad. Imagine if David never dealt with the offense from King Saul. He would have taken the throne and been an incredibly damaging person. But David throughout his life won some private victories to deal with the brokenness on the inside of him. How do we know this? Have a look at the stuff he writes in Psalm 139 verse 23. I don't know about you, but if I was David, my psalm would sound a little bit like this. Leave me alone, God. Don't touch places in my heart. (laughs) Have you ever said that to God? Just me, the only unholy guy in all of my read, 11 a.m. this morning. (laughs) David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. That is a very scary thing to ask the God of the universe to do because I can bet you now he's going to search your heart. (laughs) Try me and know my anxieties. See, some of us try and hide our anxieties. David says, you you just go for it, God. And see if there is any wicked way. Hold up. (laughs) I try and cover up my wicked ways from God and show my church face. David says, see if there's any wicked way in me. I reckon God spoke to David at the end of his life, not as a king, but as a man who had put himself under the shaping, discipling, molding hand of God. That he was prepared to do some private battles and win the private victory over personal circumstance, the rejection, the shame the anxieties, the confusion, the offenses, all that stuff. God has this conversation with David only because he was prepared to put his life on the potter's wheel. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to the pointy end of my life and leave the next generation an unmolded lump of clay. God help me that we all put ourselves continuously in the potter's wheel in the privacy of our own place so we give the next generation not a legacy of brokenness, but a legacy of wholeness. Somebody ought to say amen. Public legacy. Private victories. We see it all through Scripture. That this man who who has questionable birth, if you like, his father doesn't acknowledge him. We don't know who his mother is. That he he deals with it. He writes in Psalm 139, God, even the world doesn't know who I am, but you formed me, fashioned me in my mother's womb. All the days of my life are numbered. You know all about me, even though no one even cared that I was born. You knew, he, you could see the dealing hand, the private victory in the quiet place, out in the pasture where no one sees. We all want the pointy end conversation that David got about covenant and, and seed and, and longevity that outlives you, but we're not prepared to do the private victories. Yeah, so true. What I love about David's life, secondly, is that I reckon David won over in private, got a victory over his need for recognition. God dealt with him on that. Nothing kills legacy more than your need to be recognized and acknowledged. See, you get to leave a king's legacy from your throne when you're faithful to steward sheep in the pasture. You would have thought that as king, David would have written stuff like, my amazing exploits are going to be written all over the world. I deserve to be remembered. For killing more Philistines than everybody else. And yet David writes as the king, Psalm 84 verse 10, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand doing my own thing. I would rather be a doorkeeper. Come on, these are words of a man that understands what it's like to win the private battle over the need for, to be recognized. To be known, to be remembered as something great. David dealt with that. You know, you can you understand God's never into our humiliation. He's just after our humility. Our brother, I've been a board member of the church for 78 years, an elder for 179 years. I'm an apostle to the nation, brother. I'm not a worship leader, I'm a worship artist. (laughs) No one cares about that stuff. It's what we leave behind that God counts in eternity. Come on, are you out there? Oh, PK, I I really want to do something in my life that really makes a difference. Well, how about you show up to your roster two weeks in a row? That'll really help. 
So we all want to do something that makes a difference. We're not prepared to do the unseen, unsexy things that truly make an eternal significance. See, David gave up his, his, his desire to be recognized and said, you know, out of all the battles I want, the robes that I wear, all of my wealth, better is one day. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my, because that's what matters to me in the heart of God. I'll tell you why private victory in this area is so intrinsically linked with leaving a legacy, because it is very core. Legacy, by definition, is actually li- the living expression of selflessness. The need for recognition and legacy can't coexist in the same person. Because if I want to be recognized for my life, I will do not a lot to set up the next guy. If I care more about my life than about my sons, I will do very little to make sure that they'll succeed because it's all about me. It makes sense to you. They cannot coexist in the same person. And you have to understand that, that David, his whole life, he actually didn't dream of being a great king or a great warrior or a great war hero. That was his life. He fought many battles killed so many Philistines, won so many, saw so many of his men give their lives in the front line, his brothers in arms. They are all paid with their lives. He was a man of war. He fought those battles, not because he wanted to be a war hero. He just did it out of obedience. What David really wanted was to build God a house. That was in his heart to do since he was a little boy. You can imagine him being a shepherd boy going, man, I don't have much right now. Well, one day, God, I, you know, in my heart, I'm a worshiper. So one day, when I, by per chance, I, if I ever get into any kind of uh, lots of money, God, I'm going to build you an awesome house. And when I'm going to worship with you all the days of my life. That was his desire. That was his heart. And God says to him, towards the pointy end of his life, David, you know, all that wealth you amassed from all the Amalekites you killed and all of the Philistines, all that loot, all the jewelry and all the gold and all the silver that is now yours, guess what? You don't get to build the house that you want to build. That's a legacy thing. That's your son. I don't know about you, but if I was David, I'd go, hold up a second. Hold up. You mean all of those battles? You can imagine if I was David, and thank God I'm not. I want to help my shirt up. See all those scars, God? Wow. All those battles. Of, oh, I lost so many friends. Every battle you asked me to fight, I fought for you. The things you asked me to, to, the loot you asked me to take, I took. The loot you asked me to leave behind, I left behind. I was a bit and right through. And you're telling me that I don't get to do the very thing I've always wanted to do, which is to put my name to building you a house? God says no. Because it's not about you. Come on, are you out there? We see this in Psalm 27 verse 4. David writes as a king, One thing I have desired, one thing that will I seek, which is to be remembered for how many uncircumcised Philistines I killed. Does it say that? I said, one, the, the only thing I want, God, is to build you a house. God says, no, you're a man of war. You now. You start thinking about the legacy that's going to come after you. You can imagine David saying, hold up a second. Solomon, my son, he's a lover, not a fighter. (laughs) If there's any guy that's got any idea about building stuff, it's me, God. It's my time. I've paid my dues. Now I'm going to actually get a chance to do all the things I've worked my whole life to do. God says no. See, a legacy-minded person never wants to be remembered as being the best at anything because they want to be the people they want to because they want the people that are coming after them to do better than they did if you're thinking today i want to be the best at this you're not a legacy minded person you're thinking about yourself but if you're thinking oh i i I don't want to be remembered to be the best at this because the next guy that's going to come after me he's going to do better I don't want to be uh, remembered as that because I want my sons to do better. Come on, come on, are you out there? I don't want to be remembered as that awesome woman that, that does this and no one knows. I want my daughters to become better than me. Come on, are you out there? A legacy-minded person understands that we give up, we deal with our need for recognition. Are you still out there this morning? The third thing, I reckon, the third victory, the third private victory that, that David won was a victory of a battle that we often struggle with and that's with over-familiarity. At the pointy end of his life, you would have thought that David has seen it all. He's killed all there is to be killed. He's conquered all that there was to be conquered. He's seen the miraculous hand of God in everything. From taking down a 
a big nine foot tall Philistine to killing the lion and the bear supernaturally with his hands. To the whole thing, he's seen God preserve his life, a spear that misses his head because God was saying, he's seen it all. You would have thought that David would have got to the end of his life and thought, <laughs> you know, that awesome, that awesome legacy conversation you're having with me in 1 Chronicles 17, God, that'd be all right because I deserve it. <laughs> David has this conversation that we read earlier. It says, and it shall be when your days are fulfilled, we read this at the start, when you must go to be with your fathers that I will set up your seed after you who will be of your sons and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and, it, and he shall be my son and I will not take my mercy away from him. Catch this. And God reminds David, as I took it from him, Saul, who was before you. What was God saying? God was saying, David, what I love about you, and that's why I want to give you a public legacy, is because you were never over familiar with our relationship like your predecessor Saul was. Saul was a king, but towards the end of his life, he thought, I, I deserve the right to choose whether I sacrifice that or that. Take that loot or take that loot. I call my own shots now. I've been king long enough. You got to understand, Saul did some incredible things for God, but he died a nobody. God literally lifted his hand off Saul, puts it on David, gives him a public legacy because David never got over familiar with his relationship with God. Over familiarity will kill your legacy. One thing I look out for in all my staff, all my leaders, all the, you know, the, the people that serve, is they, are, are they still fresh or have they, 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 do I get a sense that they've been there, done that, seen it all? That what I look for in, 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 in someone that I know that's going to go on in God is that, that sense of or this is, this is what I love about David. 1 Chronicles 17 verse 15. After David heard this amazing, com this, this amazing conversation that, that God is having towards the pointy end of his life. I will set up your son and I'll st establish his covenant forever. And, and, and I will be his father and he shall be my son. And, and your seed will outlive you and he will build me a house. And all of those things. It says here in verse 15, according to all these words and according to all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Then David, I don't know about you, but if he was a different sort of guy... He might have got out on the balcony and said, hear ye, hear ye, I'm the man. God's going to do awesome things because I deserve it. David says to Nathan, thank you so much. Excuse me. Goes into the quiet place, shuts the door behind him and sits before God and says, who am I, God? Put that verse up. Who am I? And what is my house? What is my family that you have brought me this far? Come on, are you out there? This is the king of the greatest nation on the earth and he never loses the sense of privilege and honour. See, God is not after our humiliation. He's after our humility. Yeah. Come on, and when we're over familiar, this is, this, is the, this is the guy who in Psalm 8 verse 3 says, When I consider your heavens, this is a king, he writes this, The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? Oh, Lord, make me that kind of man. And you should want to be that kind of man or that kind of woman that always says, God, who am I that you would consider me? Who am I that you would still ask me to participate in your legacy? Who am I that you would consider my family to, to extend your kingdom beyond our time here on earth? Who are we that you would consider us worthy to be part of your work here on the earth? The reason why David got a public legacy is because he won the private battle over, over familiarity. God said, you know, Saul, I lifted my hand off him and I'm putting it on you, David, because I, have, I, I know that you weren't born a king. I've seen you since you were a shepherd boy and all of those years, you never lost your sense of wonder. Never lose your sense of wonder. You want to leave a legacy? Never lose your sense of wonder. Can somebody shout amen? amen. The fourth private victory that David won You know, when we read what he actually physically left behind, the tangible, touchable things that he left behind, this fourth private victory is very powerful because it's a practical one. He left an immense, enormous amount of wealth for the next generation. If we actually read in 1 Chronicles 22 verse 5, we actually, it, it just blows me away. David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, famous, and glorious throughout all countries. These are David's words. He doesn't get to build it. He was really writing out of what was in his heart. 
You can almost see him with gritted teeth. Oh, I, don't, I don't get to build it. <laughs> this boy of mine is going to marry 300 wives and 700 concubines. He gets to build it. <laughs> I will now make abundant preparations for it. So David made abundant preparations before his death. Sounds great. And, it, and then God goes into great detail to tell us how much. Verse 14. Indeed, I have taken much trouble to prepare for the house of the Lord 100 thousand talents of gold and one million talents of silver and bronze and iron beyond there is so much you can't count it andrew forrest has got no idea how much this is bhp bulletin got nothing on it i have prepared timber and stone also that you may add to them moreover there are work not just resource but labor there are workmen with you in abundance woodsmen Stone cutters, all types of skillful men. No unions, just skillful men for every kind of work. Of gold and silver and bronze and iron. You can't count it. There is no limit. Arise and be, begin working, son, and the Lord be with you. And for some of us, when we read something like that, we'd be really tempted as I have been to really think, oh man, if God would give me heaps of money, I would give some away too. Oh, I'll do some good things with it. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give to building our future. Buy the caravan. Rex Ellis, the boat that we're going to share, bro. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Jet ski, you know. And then give a few to my charities. That's awesome. But you've got to remember that David didn't amass this kind of wealth because he was born into it. He was born as a shepherd. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The fourth private victory is that I reckon that he won the battle over poor stewardship. Poor stewardship. Easy for us to think, oh, if only we could got rich, I can, I can give and have a great legacy. But the first time that we're introduced to David and money together in the same passage was not in the palace, but in the Valley of Elah. The Valley of Elah happens in 1 Samuel chapter 17 where we're introduced to David firstly. He's already been anointed as king. He's a shepherd boy. We flick the page and the next chapter, his brothers are out in battle and his dad calls him, uh, come here, what was your name again? David, okay David, <laughs> come David, uh, my real sons, my, your brothers, <clears throat> um, are out doing battle and can you please take them some takeaway food, okay, some, some fried noodles, because I'm Asian, that's how I would have written the Bible, <laughs> prawn dumplings, take, take it all, feed them. To which David says, okay, I'll be obedient, I'll do that. He gets to the Valley of Elah. He immediately sees that the nation of uh, Israel are encamped on one side of the valley. And on the other side of their enemies, arch enemies, that the Philistine army. There is no fighting going on. Just a, a, a bit of shouting. He gets there and he's just vibing the army. They're all kind of, all heads dropped. A little bit like the Eagles players after yesterday's game. Head drop. <laughs> Don't know where to look. A bit like Dockers after last week's game. Don't know where to look. They're kind of just, you know, shuffling their feet. And he's hearing one really ugly Philistine yelling at them. Not a single arrow has been shot in anger. He gets there and goes, oh, wow, what's going on there? He asks a few questions and they tell him that this has been going on for 40 days and 40 nights. So 80 times this guy has come out and hurled abuse at God's people. No one does a thing. David gets there, hears it once, and goes, all right, let's sort this out. As any 16, 17-year-old boy goes, he goes, so um, what does the dude get for taking down that guy? <laughs> as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in front. Have you seen the giant? The man asked, he comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. This is the huge reward, apparently. Uh, he will give that man... The girl and some tax exemptions. <laughs> Woo! If you're 17, you get the girl and some spare cash. <laughs> awesome. So Dave got all excited. All right, let me add him, right? So he goes and he was, some of us might know the story. He gets the smooth stones and takes the guy down. But you got to understand, when you get a tax exemption as a shepherd... <laughs> That's not a lot, is it? Some of us 
want the silver and gold and iron more than can be measured yeah. when we're not to prepare to steward that tax return. The Bible says, Jesus says this in Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with a lot. You can see how this is happening with David. Come on, are you out there? And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Next week, I'm going to develop furthermore some kingdom principles, some revelations that I'm feeling passionate to preach about. And I do every year because it's real to me. It's a journey that I've walked. Or winning the private battle over poor stewardship. Some of us, we just, we, we, we want the amazing conversation. We want the great loot at the end of our lives, but we're not prepared to steward the small. Yeah. Mm. So good. Private victory, public legacy. Musicians, you can join me. Is it helpful to you guys this morning? Yeah. You know, this sermon this morning, my prayer for us is, God, grow us, mature us. There are, I have to admit to you, and this is this, I'm, I'm showing my vulnerability here. There, there are quite a few sun, in, times during the week where I actually go, God, could you please just give me a really nice fluffy one today? Because be, I just want people to like me a bit more. But there is nothing like the Word of God to take root in us, to grow us from people that are saying, God, what can you do for me today? To become people that say, God, what can you do through me today? There is something about legacy and generations and as we begin to preach it they're inconvenient truths but they're truths nonetheless this morning as the musicians come and join me I want to encourage you today to begin to think beyond take the step as scary as it is to think beyond your time and space and your immediate need 